Um, what is this? What is this? Bring back to 905. Uh, good morning, uh, go ahead. Uh, good morning, uh, we have uh, a smoke uh, uh, problem and we're doing emergency descent to level 15140. Uh, you wish to descend to level 140? Yeah, we have already commenced uh, due to a smoke problem in the airplane. Uh, Roger, you are cleared to descend, you need to level 140. Do you uh, request a full emergency, please, a full emergency? Perhaps one of the greatest mysteries in aviation is just what was on board South African Airways Flight 295. A cargo fire spread quickly throughout a Boeing 747 in the middle of the night over the Indian Ocean many miles away from any kind of land or airport. Officially, the cause of the fire was understood to be undetermined by investigators from both South Africa and the international aviation community. However, there certainly are theories as to what the plane was carrying that could result in such a fire, a fire which ultimately killed 159 people. In this video, we will examine the timeline of events of that night and also discuss the possibilities of what cargo could have caused the fire. Discussion of this South African Airways incident will naturally have to briefly touch upon the political situation in South Africa at the time in order to have a better understanding of what some South Africans believe was on that plane. South African Airways Flight 295 departed Taipei on the island of Taiwan in East Asia at 2.43 p.m. on November 27, 1987, on a flight to Johannesburg. Flight 295 was supposed to depart nearly an hour and a half prior, but due to adverse weather, the flight was delayed. It's a long flight, even for a Boeing 747. As such, the plane was expected to make a stopover on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. It's one of a few islands off the coast of Madagascar. There were 159 people on board the plane that day, 140 passengers and 19 crew members, including a split flight crew who were working in shifts. The Boeing 747 they were flying was a particular sub-variant of the older 200 model of the plane. Officially designated as the Boeing 747-200M mixed, the plane is a combination of both a passenger and cargo aircraft. There was a reduced passenger capacity on this plane, with a significant amount of the main deck of the fuselage dedicated to being a large cargo compartment. This compartment would function like that of an actual cargo plane. A large door would open on the side of the fuselage and pallets of cargo could be loaded in. Because of this combination of passengers and cargo, this aircraft is often referred to as the Combi. South African Airways affectionately named this plane Helderberg, named after a mountain in Western Cape, although its official registration was Zulu Sierra, Sierra Alpha Sierra. There were five flight crew members on board. By the time of the unfolding crisis, the main crew had returned to their posts. 49-year-old Captain David Ice was at the flight controls, joined on the flight deck by his 36-year-old First Officer David Atwell and 45-year-old Flight Engineer Giuseppe Balagarda. The relief crew consisted of a First Officer, Jeffrey Birchall, age 37, and Flight Engineer Alan Daniel, age 34, who were by the time of the accident outside of the flight deck. The five pilots were accompanied by 14 flight attendants scattered throughout the cabin. South African Airways planes at the time needed to deviate around some countries due to the ongoing political situation. South Africa was under heavy sanctions around this time. For a significant portion of the 20th century from the 1940s up until the 1990s, South Africa was ruled by a racist white minority government. This era of South African history is commonly referred to as apartheid. Government policy had segregated South Africa down racial boundaries. The system restricted non-whites from access to amenities, restricted on where they could live and work, among countless other pieces of racist legislation. The effects are still felt in the country to this day. Massive protests, demonstrations and riots had recently broken out across the country in the mid to late 1980s. One place where segregation was not imposed was on aircraft. 
Though there were very few non-white people in the country who could afford to fly, the airline and airports of South Africa were seen as international places and weren't segregated. The apartheid government was supported by its international allies, including some European nations. While most countries in Africa did not support the government and this international opposition therefore banned South African Airways, a property of the South African state, from flying over their airspace. This resulted in routes where SAA planes needed to fly around the majority of the African continent. Possibly the most extreme example of this was their route out of Tel Aviv, which made stopovers in Rome and Lisbon before heading to Johannesburg. Flight 295 was able to make the long trip from Taipei, but only with a stopover in Mauritius, only one of a few African nations who allowed the airline into their airspace. These extra details on the South African government at the time are needed for additional context around a possible theory of what was in Flight 295's cargo. We'll come back to this later. It was now nine hours into the flight being the late evening of September 27th, the time approaching midnight. Flight 295 had been in a communication dead zone for some time as it flew across the Indian Ocean. Their last communications before contacting controllers in Mauritius was with Cocos Island, an outlying settlement belonging to Australia. Everything appeared to be normal and everything was for the majority of the Indian Ocean crossing. Flight 295 initially made a routine contact with Mauritius at 10.30pm, but transmissions went quiet for over an hour as the plane cruised on autopilot. It is not known exactly when the in-flight fire started on Flight 295, but the calm flight deck atmosphere was abruptly interrupted at around 11.42pm when the fire alarm for the main deck cargo compartment sounded. This moment was captured on the cockpit voice recording. It would take the flight crew roughly six minutes to make the first call to ATC in Mauritius regarding the fire. There is a publicly available cockpit voice recording. However, the recording was severely damaged by the crash. Once found by investigators, it had spent over a year on the ocean floor and had deteriorated considerably. The voice recording also proved to be disappointing in finding out exactly what transpired on the flight deck as the following crisis unfolded. The majority of what was recorded simply depicted the calm cockpit atmosphere along with the casual pilot banter prior to the initial alert of the fire. Only around one minute of the recording at the very end revealed the details as the events unfolded. This is that excerpt of the recording. Here, at this moment, this was the crew's first notification of something wrong. A fire alarm had sounded for the main deck cargo. The plane was less than one hour away from its stopover in Mauritius, but still hundreds of kilometers away. Despite its distance, it is still Flight 295's closest airport. Smoke detection in the cargo compartment had recently been refitted due to several noted defects in the aircraft's maintenance log. These, however, had been rectified and proved to be functioning by the sounds as heard on the cockpit voice recording. The tone you're about to hear is the 800Hz test tone for the cockpit voice recorder. It is followed by a warbling in the audio signal, which the accident report suggests that the audio input and test signal wiring were being affected by the fire.
Investigators listening to the cockpit voice recorder deduced that up to 80 electrical systems had been affected as evident by the popping of multiple circuit breakers on the recording. Among these systems affected was the cockpit voice recorder. There was around a 5 minute time frame from when the voice recording ended and the initial communication with Mauritius Air Traffic Control regarding their situation. It is believed in this time the fire was inspected and even attempts made to fight the fire. This was supported by recovered evidence including multiple fire extinguishers which showed signs of usage including burns and fragments of scorched material. We should now turn our attention towards the fire and just where it came from. The obvious possibility that premeditation in the form of sabotage was always on the minds of many South Africans at the time. However, according to the accident report, it is virtually certain that there was no sabotage, there was no explosion in the aircraft, and the presence of a high-pressure or time-activated incendiary device was extremely unlikely. The fire started within the cargo itself. Stored within the main cargo compartment were six pallets of freight. There was space for a seventh pallet which was unused on this occasion. This cargo was inspected by a ground handling agent in Taipei before the plane left for South Africa. It was noted that there was no suspicious cargo being loaded into the plane. This has not prevented some from believing that there may have actually been dangerous cargo on board. Investigators when looking over the salvaged wreckage observed significant fire damage on the pallet at the front of the cargo compartment on the right side of the airplane. It was concluded that this was the pallet where the fire started. So what did it contain? The cargo in the main deck included medical supplies, textiles, sporting equipment, tools, electrical components and electronic parts. These last two being of keen interest as this was what was stored in the fire origin pallet. When it was more closely examined, it was determined that the plane was carrying computer components and batteries in this particular pallet. One theory suggests that flammable batteries, perhaps lithium ion batteries, may have started the fire. These components happen to be packaged into polystyrene packaging. It is believed that perhaps a fire started in this pallet and came in contact with the packaging fueling a fire. Lithium batteries were a new thing in the 1980s, and we know from more recent incidents that these batteries when improperly stored on an aircraft can lead to a deadly fire. The most notable case of this in recent times being an incident involving a UPS cargo plane out of Dubai in 2010. In that incident, the fire consumed the pilot's ability to fly the plane, which then crashed into the desert outside of Dubai. Whether or not these batteries either exploded or spontaneously combusted cannot be ruled out, but to say for certain that it was the cause of the fire would be nothing more than speculation and should be treated with as much suspicion where appropriate. The other hypothesis, which is believed by a significant number of South Africans, is that the plane was carrying cargo that was not listed on the manifest. Media in South Africa speculated that the South African government was using South African Airways as its status as a passenger airline and as a state-owned carrier to import dangerous goods secretly. The country was under a firearms embargo. To keep up its ongoing military effort in the region, especially with Angola, many believe that Flight 295 was carrying weapons, ammunition, and some even believe the plane was carrying rockets and missiles. These kinds of conspiracy theories were fueled further following the replacing of South Africa's apartheid government. In 1996, Nelson Mandela's ANC-led government established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to investigate atrocities committed by the South African government during apartheid. Among these cases was Flight 295. The commission concluded that nothing listed in the cargo manifest could have ignited a fire, suggesting the cargo responsible was not listed on the manifest. This conclusion was controversial, but was backed up by chemical experts who examined fragments of the fuselage which showed fire damage from exceedingly high temperatures which they suggest could not have come from a battery or electrical fire. Because the cause of the fire cannot be certainly determined at this time, 
the official investigation does not come to any conclusion as to what caused the fire to start. The source of Flight 295's fire remains undetermined to this day. Whatever was inside this pallet, when the fire here became hot enough, it could have sparked a flash fire which consumed the inside of the cargo bay. This was also evidenced by the fact that the flooring of the cargo compartment sustained minimal fire damage. Regardless of what caused the fire to start, by the time the crew were notified and were able to inspect what was going on in the cargo section of the aircraft, the fire was already an uncontrollable inferno. As mentioned, investigators found multiple fire extinguishers along with the wreckage which showed distinctive signs of usage, suggesting that either the flight attendants or perhaps a member of the flight crew attempted to fight the fire. The flight crew contacted ATC at 11.48 p.m. The following is the ATC recording from Mauritius. Uh, Mauritius, Mauritius, bring back two nine five. Bring back two nine five. Uh, Mauritius, uh, good morning. Uh, go ahead. Uh, good morning. We have uh, a spark uh, problem, and we're doing emergency descent to level one five uh, one four zero. Um, you wish to descend to level 140? Yeah, we have already commenced uh, due to a smoke problem in the airplane. The descent to a much lower altitude from the cruising alt is part of the pilot's checklists. Flight level 140 is roughly 14,000 feet. This would mean that those on board can safely breathe the outside air. The checklist runs through all the appropriate steps the crew must take in configuring their plane to fight the fire. The Inferno on flight 295 was getting worse. Slope 295, please, huh? Okay. Request your actual position, please, and your DME distance. Uh, we haven't got the DME yet. Uh, Roger, and your actual position, please. Uh, Sorry, Tom? Your actual position? Now we've lost a lot of electrics, we haven't got anything on the, on the aircraft now. Uh, Roger, I declare a full emergency immediately. I saw that. Roger. At this point, many of the cockpit instruments had begun to fail. Following the steps in the fire emergency checklists, the captain had to follow one of the more interesting steps, which involved the opening of the passenger doors in flight. Once slowing to a slow enough airspeed, along with descending down to an appropriate altitude, where air pressure differences are not as great, the doors of passenger planes can be opened. The difference in air pressure will force the air inside of the plane outside, in theory taking the noxious smoke with it. It should be noted that there is no conclusive evidence to suggest the doors were actually opened, aside from an ATC transmission from the flight which suggests that they were opened. Several minutes have been cut from the recording here as there were no communications between the plane and Mauritius during this time. The date had now changed as midnight had passed into November 28th. What is critical to note here before we proceed with the ATC recording is that Captain Ice, who was on frequency here, inadvertently transmitted intercockpit conversations to the tower which gives us a peek into the atmosphere on board the plane. Actual weather, please, no, 
Copy, actual weather plaisance. The wind 110 degrees, 0, 05 knots. The visibility above 10 kilometers. And we have a precipitation inside to the north. Clouds, 5 octaves 1600. 1 octave 5000 feet. Temperature is 2222. And the QNH 1018 hectopascals. 1018, over. 1018. Affirmative, uh, and both runways available if you wish. for request pilot intention. The passenger cabin was pressurized with a higher air pressure than that of the cargo bay. This should have kept the passengers safe and stopped any smoke from getting into the cabin. The difference in air pressure would have meant that the air would flow from the passenger cabin into the cargo compartment, stopping smoke from passing through. This was according to Boeing and their testing of the plane for fire prevention certification. But we do know that this was not the case in Flight 295. We know smoke spread throughout the plane and even to the cockpit. The pilots began performing multiple checklists. One checklist that was performed is recommended for after a fire had been extinguished. Within this checklist was a step which involved turning on the recirculating fans in the passenger cabin. This allowed smoke and noxious fumes which contained carbon monoxide to pass into the passenger cabin through the ventilation. Autopsies from recovered bodies suggest that a number of passengers died from smoke inhalation before the plane actually crashed. South African Airways Flight 295 made its last radio transmission at 4 minutes past midnight. All radio transmissions from Mauritius go unanswered from that point. Three minutes after its final communication, the 747 crashed into the Indian Ocean. It is believed that the controllability of the aircraft was severely hindered by the fire. With lack of instruments at night, the plane could have simply drifted into the ocean. Whether or not it was a controlled crash into the ocean is up for debate. However, the accident report suggests that either the pilots had become incapacitated or structural stress tore the plane apart in the air. 159 people were killed in the Helderberg disaster. It became the deadliest air disaster to involve South Africa. The wreckage remained undiscovered for a whole year at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. It was concluded that the smoke detection and firefighting capabilities of the 747, and especially the mixed variant, were inadequate. South African Airways ceased using the mixed variant of the 747. Many recommendations were made following the investigation. Recommendations were made to Boeing to modify the 747, which included the evaluation of the cockpit voice recorder, so that it is not so prone to fire damage and the addition of an auxiliary battery. Boeing certification practices for firefighting on the plane were also criticized, as their testing conditions drastically did not fit that of an actual fire on board. One unanswered question remains. If the South African government had something to hide, it would have been incredibly easy for them to say that the wreckage was too far out of the way, and at depths that had previously never been explored. They didn't, instead choosing to investigate with international assistance. Having sank to depths lower than that of the Titanic, marine life never before seen were discovered during the investigation. A newer theory stemmed from the investigation of another in-flight fire on board a Swiss airplane. Flight 111 crashed into the Atlantic Ocean following a fire caused by an electrical arcing event. The theory goes that an electrical fault or short circuit could have started a fire or ignited material susceptible to a fire. Regardless, there are still many more unanswered questions surrounding the Helderberg crash. Though the Truth and Reconciliation Commission looked into the disaster, subsequent governments in South Africa have not followed through in solving this mystery entirely. This only fueled speculations further. Good evening everyone. Thank you so much for watching and making it through to the end, as this has been the longest video produced on the channel thus far. I really appreciate it. 
If you found this video to be interesting, be sure to subscribe as there is a new video every Saturday. And in fact, for this month of October, I am planning on making it a heavy one for content. If all goes well, there will be a further 6 videos for a total of 7 this month, with a couple of videos dropping during the weeks. A very big thanks to my patrons, of course, who have been supporting me in the creation of these videos over the past several months. If you would like to have your name featured here or read out at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and also get early access to all new videos 48 hours before they go out publicly on YouTube. On top of that, there is also a Patreon exclusive Disaster Breakdown on the Concord Disaster, so if you're interested in seeing that, consider joining. And the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. So a thank you to my five Pontier patrons, Avery Tioda, Erin Wilson, Hector Palmatellas, Ken Zachman, Kenneth Morenz, a new joiner, Leon San Jennings, Mary Ennis, MG, Pac-Man 7, Pedro Cruz, Rebecca Rivers, Saria Melody, Sleepy, So FP, and Su So Su Shoes. A massive thanks to my generous £10 tier patrons for their incredible support. Aidan Montgomery, Anne Sid, Daniel Hendricks, Derek Bean, Karma, Mike Milton, Side Effect, Roger Mayer, and Where Are My Cheetos. Thanks to all who have supported the Patreon. That's it for me this week. Have a good weekend, and I will see you next time. Goodbye!